Yes. Good evening and welcome to part four of Sambhat's four-part public series on child forensics in child sexual abuse cases. The series has been developed as part of a range of different initiatives being conducted by Sambhat to mark 10 years of POXO, critical reflections and ways forward. As a part of our year-long initiatives, we felt that it was important to take stock of the progress made under the POXO framework, but also, more importantly, the challenges that need to be addressed to bring about a more comprehensive framework for accountability under its statute. While some of these challenges are often discussed in regards to developing a child-friendly infrastructure for courts, it is also important to address the issues of the credibility of child victim witnesses, interviewing, eliciting evidence from children, appreciation of oral and forensic medical evidence in greater detail. Our moderator for the day is Dr. K. John Vijay Sagar. Dr. Vijay Sagar currently serves as the head of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and is the principal investigator for Sambad. Dr. Vijay Sagar has extensive academic, clinical, and research experience for over 20 years. His current areas of interest include neurodevelopmental disorders, especially autism spectrum disorder, pediatric psychopharmacology, adolescent mental health, child abuse, and the neurobiology of child psychiatric disorders. It is my privilege to request our moderator for the day, Dr. K. John Vijay Sagar, to please take the floor, sir. Thank you, Saro. Uh, the fourth part of this public lecture series will deal with forensic issues in eliciting evidence from preschoolers and young children. In this regard, there are important questions to consider. What are the courts looking for in terms of medical evidence? What needs to be documented in medical reports in child sexual abuse cases, especially the cases that involve the preschool children? What does international research say in terms of interpreting medical and particularly genital findings? To answer some of these questions, joining us today from the Child Witness Institute in South Africa are two experts on this subject, Dr. Karen Holley and Sorry, Dr. Karen Muller and Karen Holloway. The Child Witness Institute is a non-profit organization located in South Africa, which has been working for over 23 years on the concerns of child witnesses in cases of abuse, violence, and victimization in cases involving children. They have undertaken extensive research on matters pertaining to children in contact with the law, reformation of the justice systems, and training of stakeholders on these aspects of justice and law. They have also trained judicial officers, police personnel, and other stakeholders in the criminal justice system in several countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. A critical part of the Institute's work has been developing comprehensive court preparation programs for vulnerable child witnesses who are legally required to contend with an adversarial and often hostile courtroom environment. On behalf of the Sambad team, we hereby extend a very warm welcome to both our esteemed guest speakers today. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Karen Muller and Karen Holley uh, to this uh, session. It's also my pleasure and privilege to extend a warm welcome to our chairperson for the day, uh, Professor Shekhar Shishadri. Uh, Dr. Shishadri is currently an advisor to Sambad and he has formerly served as a senior professor uh, at the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and also as a Dean Behavior Sciences Division and Director of NIMHANS. He is a child psychiatrist with four decades of experience in the field of child mental health. His work extends beyond the clinic population, amongst others to children in institutions, education spaces, and in the context of law across the country as well as the South Asian region. In the belief that wider psychosocial interventions are rooted in child rights, in addition to his preventive, promotive, and curative child mental health interventions, Dr. Shishadri has undertaken various legal and policy-related initiatives. He was part of the national deliberations on the POXO Act 2012 during its drafting. He also served as a member of the committee constituted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, to review aspects related to survivors of sexual violence in the light of Justice Verma Committee report and to provide recommendations 
to standardize the medical examination protocols so with these words i would now like to request uh, professor sheshadri our chairperson for today's session to provide some introductory remarks thank you thank you very much uh, john friends uh, issues that have existed in medical examination for sexual assault survivors if you really examine this framework uh, i'm sure many of you are aware that in india the two finger test was widely used prior to 2013 now the poxo act as john pointed out were, came into being in 2012 you will also recall uh, around the same time uh, that there was the infamous nirbhaya case that led to national outrage and a committee was set up under justice verma called the justice verma committee and it was only after the recommendations of the justice verma committee in the wake of the nirbhaya case that this practice of the two finger test was seriously evaluated and rejected the second issue that i wish to bring to your notice is that many of the techniques of medical examination have tended to be gendered therefore even in the appreciation of medical evidence sexual history has historically played a very dubious role particularly in discrediting the child victim and witness and undermining the prosecution of child sexual abuse cases let me give you an example when the muzaffarpur case took place and we from nimhans were asked to assist the cbi many of you are aware that the case was taken away from bihar police and, and given to cbi and we assisted the cbi in the evidence gathering process and when the case came to trial the whole issue of and, and mind you these were girls who had either been trafficked or abused uh, in the past or because of family circumstances and vulnerabilities had gravitated towards risk situations the kind of cross examination which looked at their sexual history which may have occurred before the abuse took place in a child care institution plays a role in actually discrediting the child victim witness and undermining the prosecution uh, case as far as this child abuse cases were concerned today in the light of many reforms there is a more victim oriented approach uh, to victims of sexual assault yet questions remain with regard to the implementation of these victim centered approaches and the forensic accuracy of medical examinations for example i have worked on a case a few years ago dealing with sexual assault this of course uh, does not have to do with young children but i bring this to your notice because it's important this dealt with sexual assault and medical termination of pregnancy and in that case uh the products of conception were not maintained now look at the whole background of this case and how this turns out the child is in a child care institution the alleged sexual offense has been perpetrated by a staff working in the child care institution it was a, a penetrative act leading to pregnancy the person in question claims that boys from a neighboring institution used to come and interact with the girls here and therefore it was specious to accuse him of the said act 
it's a different matter that you can raise the question, what kind of an institution are you running if you're allowing people randomly to come in and cohabit with people who are supposed to be under your care and protection? But that, that's, a, that's a different uh, issue altogether. Now, what happens is that um, the girl has some uh, discomfort, is taken for a medical examination, pregnancy is suspected, a test is done, pregnancy is confirmed, um, is shifted from that institution to some other place. Uh, this uh, reality and, and, and story kind of uh, spreads within the childcare systems and then all hell breaks loose. And then some well-meaning people get into the act and, and the girl is only 14 or 15 and then it is decided uh, that a medical termination of pregnancy should be done. And it was conducted. Now, here is where the problem starts. The products of conception were not preserved, resulting in the loss of vital forensic DNA evidence. All it required was for the products of conception to be preserved. There is no issue then of anyone accepting or denying how this 14-year-old got pregnant. Now, this is as far as pregnancy is concerned and products of conception, which is hard evidence that. But if you look at other medical evidence and other DNA evidence, you know, evidence of, uh, you know, spermatozoa, for example, and we know just as an examination of uh, children that the more you delay history taking, the more the chances of memory attrition take place. Similarly, we know for a medical evidence whether in, in, in sexual offense or any kind of injury, that the more you delay examination and recording, the more you lose uh, the evidence. That There is also the question of how to contend with medical evidence where the evidence is collected, as I'm stating, after a long delay. And this is the point that I'm making, that typically this results in loss of vital medical evidence which is compounded when there are issues with the child's witness testimony as well, or at the very least, the findings are ambiguous. So these are some introductory remarks that I wanted to make to predicate the point that uh, our friends from Child Witness Institute uh, and in this session today, Karen Hollily are going to share with you uh, in terms of forensic issues in eliciting evidence uh, from preschoolers and young children and the importance of uh, medical evidence. Uh, and I wanted to make these remarks for us to keep in mind as we listen to Karen and invite uh, questions and comments from you on chat, which we will take up towards the end of the session. John? Uh, thank you, Dr. Shishadri, uh, for those opening remarks. I would now like to request uh, Karen Hollerly and uh, Dr. Karen Muller from the Child Witness Institute uh, to proceed with their presentation. Thank you so much and good afternoon to everybody. Um, um, can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes Karen, yes. you can go on full, uh, full uh, screen. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is a very fitting way, I think, um, this, this particular presentation to, to end off our very interesting series um, that has taken place over the last few days, um, or the last two weeks, but four sessions. Um, and it's, it's always very interesting to me that we end on this note because it, the medical evidence conversation is a very important one it's a very controversial one but it's one that is constantly coming up throughout all the work that we've done as the child witness institute over the last over two decades um, and this is a question that we're often asked is what do we do when we don't have a um, enough medical evidence or conclusive medical evidence and i think i would like to start off by saying that the series of topics that have been presented over the last two weeks um, are really an indication of the fact that when we are working with these cases, 
we need to um, take into account far more than just one aspect of the, um, the information that we get. We need to understand the child. We need to understand the environment, the, whether it's a cultural environment, uh, the familial environment that the child um, is raised in. We need to understand their age. We need to understand the crime, what kind of crime is committed. And we need to understand the environment in which that child will be providing information, whether that is to a police officer, to a social worker, to a prosecutor, to a judicial officer, or in this instance, for this particular topic, to a medical officer. So we're going to have a look, and it really is pretty much the holy grail of a lot of conversations around um, uh, sexual violence against children in particular, but other forms of physical violence as well, where we expect to find some form of forensic evidence that will corroborate or at least give us an answer to what has happened to this particular child. So it's, it's a difficult topic because when we look at the heading that I've used there, we're looking at understanding and interpreting. And really these are two of the most difficult aspects relating to child sexual abuse um, in terms of this forensic medicine or forensic um, evidence that we look at. When we're looking at the evidence of children in child sexual abuse cases, our courts have always regarded the medical evidence as absolutely crucial. Um, across many different countries where we have had the opportunity to work, um, we have found that this is one of the most significant um, biases or, or assumptions or even prescripts to criminal justice in cases of child sexual abuse that courts almost will not move forward without there being some form of medical evidence to corroborate the statements or the, the, um, the testimony of the child. Uh, and this then obviously gets um, trickled down through the criminal justice system itself, where it will impact on prosecutors who are willing to put forward a case of child sexual abuse where there isn't conclusive medical evidence. And again, back down to police who will hesitate to push forward an investigation where there isn't conclusive medical evidence. So we can see how the medical evidence discussion um, has an impact across the entire criminal justice process. And therefore, this is one of the reasons why we must look at the weight of medical evidence within a much broader holistic framework and understanding of the crime that has been committed against the child. Uh, without that medical evidence, as we know, a lot of our presiding officers are very wary of, of convicting. And of course, a lot of this is based on the fact that they don't have an understanding of children, um, that they don't understand how children can give good evidence, valuable evidence, uh, as detailed evidence as possible according to their child development but they're looking for some kind of concrete evidence. And this is where medical evidence and the criminal justice process are really not working hand in hand because medical evidence we know is often not available or it's inconclusive in many of the cases that we see of child sexual abuse. And I refer back to what the doctor said before, it's really a combination of factors. And one of the most important factors that will um, uh, affect whether we have good or conclusive medical evidence is timing. And timing is completely out of our control. We know from global research studies that disclosure of child sexual abuse is incredibly limited. There is a higher underreporting rate than there is a reporting rate. Immediately we know we are on the back foot when it comes to medical evidence as a result of the fact that the victim, him or herself, will take a period of time to report an incident, if they report it at all. So we have to move towards um, a much more multifaceted um, assessment of or gathering of evidence from children. We cannot just rely on one aspect of evidence only. So what are these myths and biases that I mentioned? The myth is, and it's, it's a very highly or, or a very um, commonly um, held belief 
that children who've been sexually assaulted will have medical evidence. Um, in our brains as adults, with our knowledge of sexual activity, we are assuming that children's bodies will naturally tear, break, bleed, be injured in some way, shape or form as a result. So we're expecting that to happen. And when it doesn't happen, it raises a question in our minds. And often that question is, well, surely then it didn't happen. Or how is it possible that this child has experienced a sexual assault and that there is no evidence? And already we're starting to doubt the capability and the capacity of the child who is a witness before us. In reality though, and again, a whole slew of research, um, and I've actually used two brand new studies that have come out of India recently, 2021 and I think 2019, that really look at this, this issue and, and are trying to explain how it is much more complicated than just having a form of DNA or a tear or a, an abrasion. It's, it's, it's a, a wide range of medical and or non-medical um, experiences that the child may have that cannot rule out that a sexual assault has taken place. So our argument is that while medical examination <coughs> can sometimes yield evidence of sexual assault, it can never really exclude it. And we're gonna look at the factors that play a role in this. Lots of unique medical issues that are present in child sexual abuse cases. But as I mentioned, Probably the most important aspect of understanding whether medical evidence is there or not is understanding the crime of sexual abuse against children. And by that, I mean understanding the grooming that the perpetrator uses to manipulate the child into sexual touch. It, we need to look at the age or stage of development that the child is at. We need to look at are they prepubescent? Are they pubescent? Are they older um, adolescents? All of those factors and many, many more must be considered when we understand the medical part of the evidence or lack thereof in these cases. So from this research, as I said, lots and lots of information that's been provided. Um, and I give you this following quote. There is if the effective differential diagnosis, the process of distinguishing abusive from accidental injuries, relies upon a clinician's ability to make the connection between the injury history described by the child and the, or the caretaker. So again, I'm saying multifaceted, the type of injury observed, if there is any, and the mechanisms recognized by medical research to produce such an injury. So what does the child say? What can I see? And how does that correlate with my knowledge of medicine and the impact of injury on the body. So this is very similar to what presiding officers in fact need to do when they are evaluating the evidence of a child provided in court. They're looking at what did they hear? What can they dedu deduce from that? And, and how does that relate to case law, to precedent, to the legislation? It's the same process of evaluation. Both professionals are going through it and both professionals will use what they can in order to come to an informed decision. Now I'm going to be going through quite a lot of research here with you <coughs> and case studies because I think that's the best way to try and explain how unstable an area of evidence medicine can actually or medical um, impact can actually be. Now, these case studies that I'm sharing with you are ones that we were actually involved with in South Africa. In the first case study, I had, we had a 12-year-old girl. Um, she was brought for a medical examination by her parents. Um, they reported to the medical doctor that the child had become very withdrawn. She was previously quite an animated girl. She was very uncommunic uncommunicative, and she seemed to have gained quite a bit of weight. But even more important than that, there's a deeper history behind the story than just that information. And that deeper history includes the fact that the child was living with her parents at home. Both of her parents were unemployed at the time. Um, and at some stage, both her parents um, got jobs, but the jobs took them away from the, the, the home and the family. 
So when the parents left to go to their places where they were working, they had to leave the girl with a family member. So she went to go and live with her aunt. Her aunt was also unemployed and her aunt had a boyfriend. Um, the aunt then obviously, well, not obviously, but at some stage um, gained employment, which also took her away from the home. So the child was left with the, the aunt's boyfriend. And having that history behind us as well, we can also understand the dynamic, the context in which the abusive experience took place. So in this instance, she was exposed to this man for a, over a five week period. Um, her aunt then came home and noticed that the child was behaving differently. The aunt informed the parents who came back home to take the child to the medical um, doctor for an assessment. There was a genital examination conducted and a pregnancy test. And the findings were that her genital examination was normal. In other words, her hymen was completely intact, but she was pregnant. She also disclosed that she had been raped by the, the teacher of uh, the aunt's boyfriend for over 25 times over that five week period that her family was not there. So again, what we need to do is have a look at the whole story. We need the context. We must move away from just the physical act of penetration or whatever ever other form of sexual assault may have taken place. And again, it's important for us to understand that there is physiology involved. And I often, when I train my presiding officers on this issue, I remind them that the hymen is a very, it's a, it's a, um, a very flexible tissue. It's not something that explodes on impact. It is something that can be worn away. Um, it doesn't tear that old uh, myth of a virgin bleeding on first intercourse. Those are often the, the belief systems that our presiding officers have when they understand or try to understand the concept of sexual intercourse. Similarly, in our second case study, we had a case brought to us with a nine month old female infant, um, again brought in for medical examination. Um, the mother had become suspicious of an adult family member and Interestingly enough, that um, family member eventually confessed to penetrating the infant child uh, with his penis over a period of time. Again, the examination findings were normal in this child. And the big question that everybody wants to know is how is it possible for them to be normal? And again, if we're going to understand the answer to that question, we have to look beyond just the sexual assault. We must look at the context, we must understand physiology. We must understand what the sex offender himself did in order to penetrate the child. So what we often use when we try to explain medical findings in a criminal justice environment is we look at them in terms of classifications and categories. And this really is to try and help the medical, um, prof uh, the, the legal profession to understand that there isn't a one size fits all for working with these particular issues. So there are four possible classifications of medical findings that we get from a sexual abuse examination. Your first category is that there is no indication whatsoever. whatsoever. There's everything in terms of the, the physical um, uh, structure of the child is normal, or maybe there's a slight variant to normal, but there is nothing that gives us an indication that any form of sexual assault has taken place. So no penetrative or traumatic sexual injury can be found. Um, it can include conditions mistaken for abuse, such as, for example, urinary tract infection, or maybe the child um, had a, um, an infection of, of some sort and had been scratching or rubbing. But generally speaking, medical practitioners would be able to explain that as being a normal or normal variant response. Category two, we're starting to move into maybe more of a question mark over our heads. So here we have non-specific findings where yes, it could be caused by a sexual abuse situation, but it may also be explained in terms of a non-abusive medical condition. So again, things like vaginal discharge, redness in the genital area, may be explained by the way the child has been playing. Maybe they've been playing in dirt or sand outside without any clothes on, and they've picked up some strange infection from the ground. 
um, and that's caused them to scratch. Maybe it's their reaction to the soap that's being used during their bath time. Um, some children are hypersensitive to certain things. So it raises a question mark, but we are still not able to, to uh, conclusively link what we see medically to the possibility of a sexual abuse assault. Category three, we're starting to move more into the red flag behaviors. Yeah, we're now raising um, a bit of more concern around the possibility that there was abuse or some form of, of physical trauma. And here, um, again, this is where, it, and, and I will speak about this later, but this is where the medical um, officer, the medical practitioner really needs to be very, very carefully trained and guided and supervised on how then to transition from a question mark to more of a concern around what they see I am on the child's body. So here we, the, the examiner would need to start carefully asking some questions, um, either of the child or the parent or caregiver or whoever knows the child who would be able to give them some more of a history or a context in which what they see might have taken place. But in the findings that the medical officer will then um, record, they would not be able to say, conclusively that there is um, sufficient data to indica indicate that abuse has taken place. They could say that it is one of the possible causes of the condition, but not conclusively that it is the only one. Again, we're looking at things like acute abrasions in the genital area, cuts or bruising in that area as well. <clears throat> then our final category is the one that we all want because that's where we have much more of a conclusive finding. Here we have clear evidence of blunt force or penetrative trauma. There's no other explanation that's plausible for the findings that we see. We're looking at things like the acute laceration of the hymen. We're looking at tears. We're looking at abrasions. Um, we're looking at maybe even perianal lacerations that extend um, around the anal sphincter. So we're talking about those cases where the child has been so severely um, uh, 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 viciously attacked sexually, that, they, that there was no other option but for severe injuries to take place. So those are some of the categories, but we also have what we call classes or uh, um, uh, that we can use to try and um, give a range of possibilities regarding the findings that we see. Again, like with the categories, we also have four classes, and that's in terms of making an overall assessment of the likelihood that it is sexual abuse. Again, starting from the least likely possibility, which is our class one, <coughs> sorry, here, no indication of abuse, and, of abuse. And again, what you'll notice about the classifications is that they're now starting to move away from just the physical um, findings that we see um, on the child's body to a much broader contextual investigation that includes um, uh, the child's history, if there were any witnesses, any behavioral changes in the child. This is where I get excited because we're not looking at medical evidence in terms of through a very narrow lens. We're looking at medical evidence as part of the story around which the child's experience can be framed. So here with our class one, no indications of abuse and nothing that has happened prior to this or anybody has seen or any change in the child gives us any cause for concern that there has been an abusive situation. Your class two, we're again moving more towards the, the question mark over our heads. Here's possible abuse. And where do we get that from? So we may have no medical findings, but the parent who brings the child to the doctor says she's acting strangely. I go back to my original case study that I showed you, case one where the parents reported to the medical doctor that the child was withdrawn, that she was uncommunicative and that she was eating a lot of food. So there I have a broader context. This is before he's even seen her physically. He has not done any physical examination of her. So he's taking in information that allows him to create an, uh, a story or a, a context in which whatever he finds may fit well or 
may certainly not exclude the possibility of abuse. So here we have maybe a tentative or an accidental disclosure. Um, maybe we have an inconsistent statement where the child has said one thing to her friend, the friend went and told her mother, now the child gets approached by these adults and she says no. Now, as an expert on disclosure, I would be able to explain to the court that recanting is quite common. So you would have this class and you would look at this class in terms of previously looking at category one or two of the, the, the categories that we looked at beforehand. So where we see that there may be either nothing or something that's concerning, but in addition to that, we have something else non-medical that gives us some idea of whether or not we have a medical issue um, when, uh, and, and, and the possibility of abuse having taken place. Then like your categories, your class three and your class four, class three here is a higher probability that abuse has happened. And again, this can be in conjunction with a category one, two or three, or even four um, finding of, from the medical examination. But here, in addition to the medical examination, we have a clear, consistent, detailed history of abuse. We have with abnormal physical findings, we might have some um, positive cultures for herpes or chlamydia. Um, so all of the, and the, that is where we've had perinatal transmission ruled out as the reason for that having happened. So not only do we have either a question mark medical finding or a concerned medical finding, but we also have other evidence that then allows us to make a much stronger argument or conclusion relating to the possibility of abuse. And then our final one would be your class four. And again, your class four, together with a category one, two, three, or four finding, gives us a lot more um, of a conclusive finding. Here we have a definitive sexual abuse contact. And here we, we may have found some DNA. So we've got, and going back to what the doctor said earlier about had they taken a DNA sample from the, um, the, the, the product of the, con, uh, of the conception, they would have been able to get to this class four, even though they may not have been very clear uh, medical category findings. So here we find sperm or some seminal fluid, somebody who's witnessed the abuse, maybe the mother walks in and finds the child being raped, um, your pregnancy, or oh, the one I wanted to show you there where there are photographs of the child, where the child has been used to create um, child sexual abuse material. Um, any HIV infections where other sources of infection have been ruled out. So as you can see, when we are trying to determine whether medical evidence is um, relevant or whether it's conclusive or whether it's applicable, we don't just look at the physical findings. We look at both a, a combination of physical findings as well as a broader context in which um, the abuse may have taken place. So as I said, there's lots of research and medical findings relating to this. Um, and our findings consistently show that a clear and definitive medical finding is very, very seldom um, present in child sexual abuse cases. And again, this is because of multiple factors such as um, how long it's taken the child to report, um, when the child takes their statement, all of those types of things are going to play a huge role. And I really want to stress this last point here. We have to be aware of how traumatic medical examinations are. Before Karen and I started the Child Witness Institute, I used to do the pre and post medical examination counseling for victims of child sexual abuse. And the number of times we had to um, sedate and or physically hold a child down in order for the doctor to be able to do the medical examination was horrific. And I can tell you now that the impact on the child from that medical examination can in many instances be worse than the sexual assault in the first place. So as I said, we're just going to have a quick look at some of the research. One of the studies, it's normal to be normal. Here they reviewed 236 children's case files, including colposcope photographs. And they confirmed that sexual abuse had taken place. The average age of the victim was nine years. In 63% of the cases, there was reported penile genital penetration, but 
of that 63%, there were normal findings in most or the second most um, cases. 28% of those cases, there were normal physical findings. In 49% of the cases, there were non-specific findings. So you can see that in the majority um, of, of cases, you are going to have an inconclusive medical evidence, okay? The study was important in that it argued that medical doctors and other personnel who are trying to get um, information from um, patients must learn how to conduct proper interviews and that your physical exam should not be relied upon only to provide proof of abuse. In subsequent research, another one forensic evidence, and this is important for later, prepubertal pre victims, so children who have not reached puberty yet, 273 medical records were examined. The children were under the age of 10, and all of them had been examined within 44 hours of the assault, which is a very important and very impressive time frame. Um, we have a, a time window of up to 72 hours, after which there really is very little point, unless there are heinous injuries that the child has experienced. Within those cases, only 24% had any form of positive forensic findings. 90% of those kids had actually been seen within 24 hours, which is the holy grail of medical um, uh, examinations. If you can get a child within 24 hours, you've won the lottery. And of those 24%, only 23% only of those children had any genital injuries. 88% of them were examined within that 24 hours. So you can see that it really is very difficult for us to constantly rely on medical evidence only to give us an indication of whether sexual assault has happened. What they found there is that children's bodies heal rapidly, rapidly, particularly regarding the superficial mucosal injuries. So, <coughs> sorry, unless the child is savagely raped um, and, and there are se severe injuries. In the majority of cases, the physical body is capable of healing quite quickly. So again, the, uh, the outcome of this study was that when we examine victims, we should do it as early as possible if we're going to try and get any physical evidence. But again, remember, that's not up to us only. It's up to whether the child, him or herself, is ready to report. Another study, 2,384 children were referred for possible sexual abuse. Again, a very low rate of findings. Only 4% of the children had abnormal examinations and only 5.5% of the children with a chronic history of vaginal and anal penetration showed abnormal medical results. So it really is very important that we look a little bit beyond the box. So, as I said, your physical injury is only one component of the trauma that is sustained and the sexual abuse can never really be ruled out on the basis of normal findings on a physical examination. So we have to be able to see this in a broader context. So why do we not have medical evidence? And again, I've mentioned this a little bit before. Some of the reasons include, and I've mentioned this, delay in reporting. Remember, we've got a 72 hour maximum window period for us to really be able to gather or see medical evidence that would be able to provide us with a conclusive uh, finding. The majority of cases of child sexual abuse are either not reported or reported weeks, months, and even years later. We cannot rely on the reporting rate of child sexual abuse um, as a, a, um, a prerequisite a pre or, or an argument for the use of medical examinations in child sexual abuse cases. Um, also, an abuse can be consistent with no medical findings. We must remember that abuse occurs on a, on a range or a continuum of different behaviors. Um, things like showing children pornography is abusive, but they don't even need to be touched. Um, suggestive comments, um, uh, making the child stimulate him or herself. So we've got to take into account the difference between your non-contact abuse and your contact abuse and what contact abuse actually means. Is the child being forced to stimulate themselves? 
Um, is it digital penetration? A finger is, is smaller than a penis and will probably not um, cause um, as much of an injury as a penis. Um, is, is, there, is the uh, offender using lubricants? Is the offender him or herself, or let's say himself, um, maybe they have a very small penis. Um, there are so many physical factors to take into account. Um, maybe there was no penetration. Maybe the offender uh, placed his penis between the legs of the child. So all of those factors need to take and be taken into account. There's also a lack of training. A lot of medical practitioners don't know how to do medical examinations in sexual abuse cases. I think the last time I spoke to one of our medical faculties at the university here, there's a six month course or six month module that medical doctors, as they are training, are required to do, unless they specialize in this area. But a lot of it is ad hoc um, seminars and workshops, and, and it doesn't really afford them an opportunity to become a, a good specialist in this area. Other things that we must take into account are things like the elasticity um, of the hymen, of the vaginal, and the anal opening in children. Um, we know, and I'm being very simplistic here for time's sake, but we know that a child, when a child is born, um, they are born with quite a lot of their mother's hormones. And those hormones, if you can cast your mind back to when you had a child, those hormones tend to make uh, the genital areas of the child quite swollen. And that swollenness of the genital area um, is actually causes that area to be quite elastic. So it is possible to penetrate a nine-month-old, a two-year-old child without causing significant injury or scarring. Also, we mentioned earlier healing. Children's bodies heal very quickly. And, and of course, your genital area is one of the parts of the body that has quite a significant blood supply. So we know where there is a significant blood supply that there's a greater chance of healing. And then of course, when a child get, grows older, when they start to, when they reach puberty and start to produce um, their own estrogen, again, their bodies will make, uh, or that their hormones will make their vaginal openings and their hymenal areas a lot more elastic and, and, and fluid. So it's possible to penetrate without causing any significant harm. As I mentioned with your delay in reporting, um, your injuries are going to heal very quickly as well. So your evidence of an injury may be very minimal or it may be absent where the delay is days or weeks after the incident has taken place. Also in terms of um, the type of abuse, as I mentioned, it must be consistent um, with whether there are medical findings or no medical findings. We're not expecting to get medical findings where there is a non-contact abuse. So we also need to understand what the full range of sexual violence and sexual assault can be um, in terms of whether it's a contact or a non-contact and what that looks like for the child. We also know that unfortunately, it's very easy to eradicate a lot of evidence. And of course, a lot of our victims feel very dirty, feel um, very ashamed after a, a, a sexual assault has taken place. And their first instinct is to wash, to take off their clothes, to brush their teeth. Um, also, there may be a very high um, need or uh, for them to go to the toilet as a result of the, the sexual assault. And all of those types of behaviors have a good chance of interfering with or eradicating a lot of the evidence that we may see. <laughs> when it comes to the lack of training, and again, this goes back to what we've spoken before, uh, spoken about before in the previous um, workshops, it really is important for medical doctors to understand the child's age and their developmental capacity in that age when they are questioning them about these things. Um, it's also important that they don't ask them leading questions, um, that, that they also understand the child's responses. Like for example, if the child says he put it in, doesn't necessarily mean that it was full penetration. It could be between her legs. Um, so as a, as a result of that, we know that genital to genital contact doesn't always result in physical trauma. I've mentioned the elasticity and the estrogen. 
and the fact that our offenders often will use re lubricants. Remember, going back to the beginning of this workshop series, I think the thing that underscores everything is that the most important part for a, a, a person who sexually assaults a child is to make sure that he or she is never caught. So they will do what is needed, whether it's uh, through grooming, uh, whether it's through the child self-stimulating, through the use of lubricants, um, all of those factors, they will use that because they do not want the child to go to hospital for a doctor to find that they have been sexually assaulted. So with this all in mind, we need to find other avenues of evidence in child sexual abuse cases. And probably the most important one is the child, him or herself. We know that in sexual abuse cases, these crimes are committed in private. Very seldom are there any witnesses. And the child is usually the only source of information that we have to be able to determine what has happened. So we need to, as we've been saying along for the last two weeks, we really, really need to spend a lot more time with the child, him or herself, using the correct techniques to try and find out what has happened. So what are we looking for if we want to, to understand um, eliciting evidence from the child in this particular topic? We know from what we've spoken about this week that we can get evidence from very young children. They are capable of testifying accurately. However, it does require a certain level of expertise and specialization. So anyone, whether it's a medical officer, a police officer, a judicial officer, um, any other court personnel must have the requisite expertise and skill in getting evidence from children. And that is not to say that we eliminate the medical exam, it's in addition to the medical exam. So every single one of us working with children who are victims of, of violent crime must have training and knowledge of child development and how children can speak and how they explain what has happened to them. If we have that as a basis, we will be able to get accurate information that could persuade a judicial officer, regardless of whether there is medical evidence. So it requires quite a significant paradigm shift to view the child as the most important source of information and not the medical exam. However, having taken that into account, let's have a look and see how the child can help us in understanding any medical findings or non-findings. The child comes, as I've mentioned, with a story. So it is very important that we look at the full context of that child and where they've come from and what medical history they have. <clears throat> so an accurate and complete history is absolutely essential when making a medical diagnosis. If I don't know that the child in front of me has a history of um, skin rashes as a result of certain soaps, I will not be able to evaluate what I see correctly. So I must have that medical history. I must bring a parent or find out from the family doctor if there is one, what this child's previous medical history has been. So the history will include anything, your physical symptoms that the child may be presenting with. But, and this is where it gets important, emotional and behavioral symptoms. Has the child changed? In what way have they changed? When did this change happen? And what kind of behaviors are they um, exhibiting? Are they aggressive? Are they uh, withdrawn? Are they self-harming? Um, are they isolating themselves? Do they show signs of depression? All of those we know are indicators of trauma. So if we can identify through the behavioral and emotional symptoms that there is a problem, then we will be able to have that fuller contextual um, framework when we conduct our medical examination. <clears throat> also, if the child offers any information about the abuse itself, then again, 
This is why it's very important for medical professionals to understand child language, to understand child development so that they can interpret what the child is telling them in a much more accurate way. What is very important as well is that we cannot expect just one set of professionals to always be responsible for doing this work, particularly when they have been um, specialized in a particular field such as medicine. It's a very important idea or suggestion or recommendation that a medical examination involves a multidisciplinary team of people. Um, in in the smallest context of that, or, or what that might look like in a very under-resourced area, would be at least a medical practitioner and a social worker, or a lay counselor, somebody who can be there to support the emotional um, needs of the child while also supporting them through the medical examination. Um, in best practices, it would be a case of having a psychologist um, present, a medical doctor president, present, and a forensic interviewer present um, in order for everyone's specialization to be um, possible during the medical exam process. And it's very important that the medical history of the child may differ, but still complement the forensic interview that the child gives. So for example, um, if the child has a medical history of physical symptoms related to painful urination, the medical doctor may be able to link that directly to a recent episode of sexual abuse and provide additional information of forensic significance, such as in this age group, urinary tract infections are very um, unlikely. Um, and as a result, this is a, I would say, category three class three um, possibility of sexual assault having taken place. It's also very important that the history is obtained not just from the child, but also from any non-offending caregiver or anybody else trusted to the child who knows the child. Um, somebody who has a history of the child's life and any experiences that the child may have gone through. This also provides the medical doctors with an opportunity to assess if there are any fears or concerns related to the abuse. The child may come in and lie to the medical doctor and say, no, they fell off something, um, or they are allergic to the soap that the, their mother has used. Um, but if the, the doctor has a much better understanding of the history of the child and can speak to the child and build rapport and be empathic, there is a good chance that the doctor will be able to push past the barriers that the child has put up and find out what has happened. So that's our child. Now let's have a look more specifically at the examination, okay? Your examination is going to be performed by a medical provider who should have specialized training in sexual abuse evaluations. Now, there's a very big debate out in the world as to what constitutes specialized training. Um, is it the number of years you've been practicing? Is it the number of cases you've done? Um, <coughs> is it the training you've undergone to, to do these types of evaluations? And I think it will probably be a combination of all of those. Um, we do see globally a move towards the use more often of forensic nurses, A, because they are more readily available, and B, because they can concentrate on this particular field as an area of expertise. Now, your examinations, as with any medical situation, are going to be triaged. Um, they can be prioritized as an emergency. That will be more often the case when there are significant injuries that have been experienced by the child. They can also be categorized or prioritized as urgent. And then they can also be non-urgent. And your non-urgent ones are really where there has been a significant time delay between the incident and the reporting of the crime. Um, and or, you know, your time is really going to be your biggest one. Um, and there are no other injuries or underlying conditions that the, the victim is um, reporting. 
If there is an emergency, the emergency evaluation should be done without any delay. Um, but with your urgent and your non-urgent evaluations, you can do the medical examination between one and seven days after the child has disclosed. So there isn't as much urgency because we know that we're not necessarily going to find any concrete evidence. Where necessary, we should do follow up examinations, particularly where there has been possibly um, the, uh, a sexually transmitted disease um, or there have been a particular injury that requires follow up um, examination to ensure that there is healing done. Now, what has been very interesting in the last um, while has been this need or this, this recommendation to shift the medical examination where we know that the incident has happened quite recently from 72 hour rule to a 24 hour rule for prepubertal children. And the argument there is that the, the chances of finding DNA in this particular age group is much more likely within 24 hours as opposed to 72. And that really is because of the physiology of the prepubertal child. Most of the, the Indian forensic labs are using a standard sexual assault kit for female victims of all ages. But what we know, well, that, that examination includes a breast swab, a body fluid collection, an anal swab, an oral swab, a vaginal secretion swab, cervical mucus collection, and then very importantly here, combing, cutting of pubic hair, um, checking underneath the fingernails, dental floss and toothpicks to take uh, any form of evidence in the mouth, blood and urine samples, uh, which are obviously best suited for female victims that have attained puberty. So the current kit is more specifically relevant to those victims, female victims predominantly that have achieved puberty. What we're missing out on with prepubertal children, which is why the argument is we need to get the DNA a lot faster for them, is that they are more limited in being able to provide samples such as cervical mucus collection, um, the pubic hair, they don't have it. Um, and doing a breast swab is going to be irrelevant in those cases. So our, our scope of medical evidence is much more limited in prepubertal children. And therefore the argument is in those cases, we need to get them in a lot faster if we are going to find any DNA evidence. So there needs to be modification to the current evidence collection kit that takes into consideration the needs and, and the physical capacity of your prepubertal children. Then there are three key strategies that are used for specifically a genital examination. Here we have the direct visualization. In other words, we're looking with our own eyes at the child's genital area, usually as they lie on their back with their legs open, or if they are positioned um, on all fours with their backside in the air raised so that we can see the genital area. Then in addition to that, um, staining techniques are found to be quite useful in identifying any tears or abrasions or anything else related to an injury. And of course, the holy grail of medical examinations, which is the colposcopic examination, which is the use of a very, very highly pixelated uh, camera that can take photographs of the area and uh, will be able to show in, in extreme detail if there are any signs of injury. And of course, that is your first prize method of medical examination where you do not need to physically touch the child. You are not invading their um, genital area, which is exactly what happened to them when they were raped. In India, specifically the use of staining and colpus, uh, colp Colposcopic examinations has not really gathered too much momentum yet. It's not prevalent yet, but hopefully moving more in that direction. Then again, we also, when we think of medical evidence, we always focus on the genital area, but the um, oral area as well is, is very important. And here we can actually gather quite a lot of medical evidence if we get there in time. Um, and where we need to check includes the edges of the mouth, um, a child who's had to perform oral sex on an adult male, 
Um, the child's mouth is very small. You may find that there are tears to the outer edges of the mouth and the oral cavity must also be inspected. So injuries to the palate, uh, the gums, if there was any tearing or, or rubbing, um, any, anything that has happened to the child's teeth, particularly if the teeth are um, milk teeth or baby teeth um, and may have been strained as a result of the, of the action. Anything to do with the pharynx and then also looking at this little frenula at the underneath the tongue. Has it torn? Um, what has happened if there's any evidence there that we can collect? <coughs> also, what's very important is that your sexual assault kits should not only just be based on the age and the gender of the victim, but also on the relevance of the evidence collected. And this is very important when we consider the accused. Very seldom do we do a medical examination of the accused, but I find that he has or she has nail clippings, um, which may very much help us to understand if there was any vaginal penetration with the finger, digital penetration. Um, maybe he grabbed the child and in doing so scratched the child. We may find some um, nail clippings or some evidence under the nails that will also help to corroborate what the child has said. So your medical record must include some form of a history, observations, disclosures the child has made, any lab findings, and it must be interpreted in a context, okay? And, and it must be expressed in a very simple way as well, so that the, med, the legal fraternity is able to understand what has happened. Photo documentation is highly recommended, again, your colposcopic um, examination would be helpful there, but your photographs should never substitute the written description that the doctor has made in his report. So your child's history remains the most important piece of evidence in child sexual abuse evaluations, and your physical findings that result from sexual abuse when they are present are very important, as we know, in investigative and legal arenas. But we cannot assume that it did not happen if we don't have that medical um, evidence because in the majority of sexual abuse cases, victims have normal genital examinations. So we have to be able to look at the context in which this has happened. Not having a, a physical finding does not prove or disprove that sexual abuse has happened. And I think I'm going to finish off there that since medical evidence is often inconclusive, there are important other factors that need to be taken into account when we evaluate child as a team. Thank you. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, so uh, to start the discussion for today's uh, session, uh, I will uh, start with a few questions. Uh, most adversarial criminal justice systems prioritize oral or testimonial evidence. Medical evidence typically plays a collaborative role in appreciation of evidence. However, as child witnesses have developmental limitations, in some cases, medical evidence is relied upon more heavily to establish the veracity of this allegation of child sexual abuse. What do you think are the implications of this, considering that medical evidence is not always precise? I think the implications are very devastating. And I think the only reason, when I listen to the question already, um, the, the issue that's highlighted there is that there's a belief that children, that information cannot be gathered from children. But the argument is, is that it can be, it just takes a, a new or an extra level of, of ability to do it. So you can't ever replace a child's um, verbal testimony with, with medical evidence, because as we see, medical evidence is, is not a stable enough area of forensics for us to be able to build an entire case upon it. Um, children can give evidence and it's up to us. This is what I said in my last presentation. It is up to us. We are the ones who have to do the work to get that information out of the child. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have a question uh, from one of the participants of today's session, uh, who is an additional district and sessions judge. Uh, though it is not related to uh, medical evidence per se, 
the question is uh, how do we elicit testimony from a child witness or a victim witness who has speech and hearing impairment now that's that's a whole new series of workshop sessions i'm afraid um <laughs> Yeah, when we're talking about children with disabilities who are witnesses, um, there is there are a number of different features that can be adopted, but obviously we need to make use of people who are specialists in being able to communicate with children, particularly those who have the so-called invisible disabilities, which are more the mental disabilities and the communication disabilities. Um, we, in fact, work with a, um, a, a specialist who does all of our disability training, um, and she did her PhD on how to conduct a competency assessment test with children who have um, a Down syndrome and autism and ADHD. Um, and, and it's very much possible, but obviously there are going to need to be certain accommodations, including the training of court personnel on understanding the evidence that the child gives, but also the introduction of accommodations, such as the use of somebody who understands the child language to act as an interpreter on behalf of the child. And I don't just mean a sign language interpreter, I mean a communications interpreter, because if you have a child with Down syndrome who has very limited speech, but the person is trained to understand both the nonverbal as well as verbal communication provided by the child, they would need to be able to interpret that for the court. It is a lot more difficult when working with children with disabilities, but it's not impossible. It just becomes more resource intensive, time intensive, and the court must be a lot more patient and a lot more accommodating. Yeah, thank you. Uh, even in the international consensus, like the Adams classification, there are certain genital findings for which there exists no expert consensus on whether or not the findings are indicative of penetrative sexual abuse. How do we contend with this reality in cases of child sexual abuse? Don't just focus on the medical. Get the information from the child. This is what we're saying. Build the context. The child will give you the information. Is that information um, adequate? Do you understand what has happened? So this is why. In many ways, our medical examination is um, it's a it's a gift if we get it for for these types of cases. It's it's never what we should start from. We should start with the child. And once we have got something from the child, then anything else that we get is additional information that helps us with our cases. So my answer to that is. If you can't get it from the medical evidence, get it from the child. Yeah, thank you. Uh, apart from genital findings, there are also other types of medical evidence indicative of non-penetrative child sexual abuse. What are your views on these types of medical evidence and their utility? Can you give me an example? Or can they give me an example? Uh, what kinds? Say, for example, uh, the non-penetrative uh, child sexual abuse but it could be a contact abuse wherein uh, there could be uh, certain uh, you know, injuries in the other parts of the body, not the gentle areas. Uh, so some abrasions, uh, as okay, you mentioned, so like may, maybe right, in the sorry, lower, yeah. lower part of the body, but not essential yeah, on yeah. gentles, could be on the legs right, of so the child, etc. Yeah. We're talking about the, um, the interplay between multiple forms of abuse. And I mean, I think this is very, it's a very important question and it's an important point. You know, we often talk about sexual abuse or physical abuse or um, neglect of the child. What we fail to understand and acknowledge is that there are usually multiple forms of abuse that occur in any one case. If I'm going to be walking down a dark street and a person um, wants to uh, attack and rape me, they're going to grab me, they're going to throw me on the ground, they're going to um, put their hand over my mouth, put their arm in my neck, Put a gun to my head they, they're going to be there's going to be a lot of activity happening so uh, and we had a case like that with a young girl who was thrown onto onto the ground or placed actually no not thrown placed on the ground by the offender but he placed her on an area that was full of of thorns so she got scratches on her back so again 
this is all part of the puzzle. Every single piece that we have, we put that all together. But of course, I would need the child to say, he put me on thorns. And then I can check her back and say, there are scratches that are, um, uh, you know, that are likely to have been caused by thorns. So there is a, there's this congruency in what she's saying. So absolutely, we can look for other forms um, or signs of physical, um, uh, not necessarily injuries, but indicators that corroborate what the child has said uh, verbally to us. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, finally, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Karen Muller uh, for her uh, uh, comments, uh, last comments, as this is our you know, fourth and final session of the series and uh, no, uh, Dr. Muller. Uh, yes, um, I think if, if we've looked at, at what we've been discussing over the last few um, sessions, the, th the key for me are two words, um, specialization and a holistic approach. And I think that is the way we need to move forward in terms of looking at all the, the different topics we've been discussing. Um, they're all fit together. We, we cannot uh, evaluate a child in terms of medical evidence or in terms of trauma or in terms of ability. All of those things need to be looked at in, um, together. And for that reason, it requires a, a specialization to be able to deal with these cases. And that is the move that has been adopted internationally is towards the specialization um, of understanding and dealing with cases involving children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now it's uh, over to our chairperson uh, for today's session, uh, Dr. Shishadri, uh, for his uh, summarizing and final comments. Thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karen Muller and Dr. Karen Hollily uh, for all the four sessions. And I hope that this is uh, the start of a rich and future collaboration and friendship with the Child Witness Institute and, and Samvad. I have the following uh, comments uh, to make. The first is, Remember when Karen Hollily spoke about the fact that sometimes sexual abuse exists with other stuff that goes on. And, and in this context, where there is sexual and physical uh, findings and indications, and if you come to sexuality, uh, I'd like to point out that the difference between sexual misbehavior, sexual harassment, sexual abuse and sexual violence or assault in terms of its medical significance, one on the one hand where brutalization takes place and on the other hand where there is grooming, but there are actually no physical findings. I want to draw your attention to what Karen Hollerly has said repeatedly, context matters. And in our evidence gathering to take this context into consideration, and also look at physiology would be a very important issue. A second point, by and large prominence is given to medical evidence, but as was pointed out, medical evidence is present in a minority of cases and therefore the importance of history taking in. And this was what Karen Hollerly started with. What is the environment in which the abuse took place and the evidence gathering and those processes are being carried out to who? The police, the judiciary, uh, the, the doctor, the medical officer, and the sensitivities that are required for these processes. Because let us remember, acknowledge, and never forget that child sexual abuse, psychosocial, legal, and medical processes can be as sexualizing and as traumatizing if not done with the kind of sensitivities that are required. Next, the timing and its criticality. Between when the act took place, the disclosure, the processes that led to the medical examination, the triage involved, 
And the issues that Karen has spoken about, the shift of the 72-hour rule to the 24-hour rule. So these are medical processes that we need to keep in mind as we go ahead. And this is the importance why a multifaceted approach where we combine historical and medical evidence to piece together the whole story becomes important. The categories that Karen Hollerly referred to, one, two, three, four, are really what we call as indices of suspicion. Your category four being your highest index of suspicion. This does not mean that category one does not carry any index of suspicion. It still has an index of suspicion, but you link that with the classes that she spoke about. And we have referred to this in another format of, of the pyramid, which is at your highest level of index of suspicion is discovery. When an eyewitness actually sees someone assaulting a child to detection of pregnancy of HIV AIDS, to disclosure of abuse, to your second level where a child gives hints or there's sexualized behavior in a young child, or there is avoidance of a particular person. I don't like him. He's not a nice person. To symptoms of PTSD and dissociation, to sleep disorders, regression, depression, school refusal, behavioral changes of the nature that Karen Hollerly referred to, to conditions that exist in society that abuse is going on, but we will never know because the child has been threatened or a child has been shamed, or the grooming has gone on for such a long time, there is, the, there is no assault, there is no injury, but the child has been manipulated into believing that uh, you know, this is a, a, a normal uh, relationship that is being carried on. And, and this is the reason why as an expert witness, the importance of preparation we, you know, often in our documentation, uh, you know, the uh, speech and language yeah. issue, John, that you spoke about and in one of the instances where uh, we had actually asked the assistance of a sign language interpreter. And when uh, I went as an expert witness to the court, the defense lawyer asked me, what is the name of the sign language interpreter? And I'm looking at the file and I, it's not documented. Can you show me the referral letter that you wrote to the sign language interpreter asking for a request? The referral letter is not there. Can you tell me on which date the sign language? So you see the importance of the date of the examination, the timing, in which language did you speak to the child? And in, in India is a country, even Bangalore, where we live in, is a country where many languages is spoken are spoken. And the language in which... so. In which language did you speak to the child? I spoke to the child in the vernacular language, but your report is in English. So is, is this a translation? Is this a transliteration? Who translated it? Where is the signature of the translator? You see how important it is therefore to look at expert witness preparation, particularly of a medical professional that and this is the reason that the point Karen Muller made of specialized training and of the kit being available is so important. And finally, friends, the whole issue of a young child who is in a home with neglectful parenting, there is some household help uh, with poor hygiene who keeps fingering the child. The child has frequent UTI that why would a child have frequent UTI that, you know, and then it is treated, it recurs, and this uh, abuse goes on for several mm -hmm. years. The child reaches uh, puberty, the UTI turn, turns into pyelonephritis, then it turns to end uh, stage kidney disease and, and culminates uh, essentially in a nephrectomy. And the importance of medical friends is precisely this. Organ loss is a very heavy price to pay for child sexual abuse. Loss of identity and loss of an affirmed sexual identity for a child growing up is a very heavy price to pay for child sexual abuse. We have an obligation, friends, when we look at forensics, when cases go to trial, to really equip and skill ourselves in the manner that the Child Witness Institute has taken us through these four sessions 
particularly in this, the 10th year of Poxo. And this four-part series is one of uh, the many set of events that we're going to be doing in this entire year to look at what this law, this wonderful law, uh, uh, has been in terms of how it plays on, on the field and what our challenges are uh, going ahead. So these are some of the thoughts I wanted to share with you, uh, uh, together with expressing our deepest gratitude to Dr. Karen Muller and Karen Hollerly from the Child Witness Institute in partnering Samvad in this four-part series as our uh, set of events for 10 years of Poxo. Thank you. Thank you. And we send you over to Saurav yeah. to close the session. Yeah, over to Saurav. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, as one of the many people who's benefited from this public series, uh, a sincere gratitude from me and the rest of the Sambath team as well to uh, the Child Witness Institute, to Karen Horley and Dr. Karen Mueller. Uh, I think as uh, Dr. Seshatri mentioned, the point of the series wasn't to have a conversation, but rather to begin one. And each and every one of these issues, I think, are particularly important for all of us engaged in uh, child-related work in the domains of sexual abuse in India. So I think this provides us a fantastic opportunity to really begin uh, further research and work on some of these issues. And as Dr. Seshatri mentioned, uh, we will be coming back with a lot of other initiatives as part of our 10 years of POXO year-long series. So this is not the last of our uh, initiatives this year. So please stay tuned uh, to all of our social media, YouTube channel, and uh, our communications to stay updated on what we're doing in the upcoming months. Uh, for some of our friends who I know have perhaps joined us for today's session but couldn't be there for the previous three sessions, please don't fret, don't worry. Uh, all four parts of the series are available on YouTube and uh, we'll be collating these together so you can access all of it uh, on our YouTube channel. So with that, uh, thank you very much, everyone, and good evening. Thank you. Yeah, good thank, evening. You. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen. Karen and Karen. Uh, Bye.